Welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the President and CEO, and I always brag that we have been voted by our peers uh, to be uh, the U.S. think tank to watch. Well, let me suggest that the OSCE is the international organization to watch, uh, voted by the world. And so it means a lot to us uh, to be able to host uh, Secretary uh, General Lanier here today. Uh, a special welcome, I don't know if they've all arrived, to a number of ambassadors. We expect ambassadors from Albania, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Luxembourg, and Malta. Have I forgot, left any of you out? Any other ambassadors here? Okay. Uh, in early February, I met with uh, Secretary General uh, Zanier in uh, Munich, where we discussed the possibility of collaboration between the Wilson Center and the OSCE. Uh, of course, I was aware, and we're all aware of the OSCE's important role and history. Uh, the Secretary General told me about the security days that he has hosted over recent years. And in fact, uh, I will fly to Vienna later this month from Kyiv, uh, where I'm uh, one of the election observers, to participate in one of the OSC uh, security days. Uh, as a recovering politician, myself having spent 17 years in the U.S. Uh, Congress, I know that political events can move very quickly and that in political years, uh, a day or a week can make a huge difference. But I have to say it never occurred to me a few, that a few months could make this big a difference. Uh, since our meeting, meeting in Europe, the OSCE founded as the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe in the early 1970s, and which has played uh, a, a significant role, but not the outsized role it now does in the neighborhood, uh, now the OSCE is in the catbird seat. The crisis in Ukraine represents a major opportunity for the OSCE to move to center stage as the lead in the negotiating process. And for those of us who are listening to the news and reading the newspapers, we know that that is exactly what's happening. The OSCE is the only institution that both Russia and Ukraine, two of 57 member countries, including the United States, have identified as being able to address the ongoing crisis. Thus, it enjoys a unique level of confidence and a unique opportunity. Of course, the fact that the OSCE operates by consensus can make the road ahead difficult. But as I said, the opportunity is great, and this morning we will hear more about it at the only public event uh, in Secretary General Zanier's trip to Washington. The Wilson Center has been tracking events in Ukraine very closely over many, many years. Our Kennan Institute was founded, it's our oldest institute here, 40 years ago. Uh, its original and long-term director, Blair Rubel, is right over there. And its current director, Matt Rajansky, is right over there. Uh, earlier this month, uh, we hosted Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel on the future of NATO, 20 years after the signing of the 1994 Brussels Declaration. We have 1,400 scholar alumni uh, worldwide from our Kennan Institute, and 100 of them are on the ground right now in Ukraine, and I'm looking forward to meeting many of them uh, starting next Wednesday. They help keep doors and dialogue open. And as Matt Rajansky said at a major, as, a, at Matt, as Matt Rajansky said at a major Wilson dinner, uh, Kennan Institute dinner, uh, just this past Tuesday. Ambassador William Hill is one of those alumni, and he will return here this fall. He was twice head of OSCE's mission to Moldova. Last week, by coincidence, we held our annual Atasari Symposium here. Uh, Atasari was the president of Finland some years back, and he has uh, supported this, this uh, event here every year, and he was personally here. At that event, the keynote speaker was uh, former uh, German ambassador to the U.S., Wolfgang Issinger, uh, who has become, in the last several weeks, a distinguished scholar here. Well, guess who was called on just a few days ago to go and co-convene the OSC roundtables uh, in Ukraine? Uh, they've been meeting in Kyiv, but they are apparently going to start moving around the country. Wolfgang Issinger. So we're really very proud uh, that we have a lot of our people on the ground, in the right places, 
hopefully helping this impressive organization uh, to uh, negotiate a reasonable and responsible end to the crisis. When Ambassador Issinger spoke in this room last week, he said, quote, uh, this is what he said, uh, the OSC was all but forgotten, unfortunately, until the current crisis. With the military verification team and civilian monitors on the ground and 100 long-term and 900 short-term election observers ready for May 25, the OSCE is at ground zero, scheduling an all-Ukrainian roundtable to discuss national unity. At last reports, uh, the separatists have, have, have yet to participate in these roundtables, but the question of how to reshape the government is front and center. So is the issue of corruption and mismanagement. Uh, something we say here often is, it's, in the end, it's the Ukrainians themselves who are going to have to usher in a competent, pluralist, and transparent new government, which, sadly, they have not enjoyed since the Orange Revolution. But the OSCE is uniquely positioned to help them do this. So, here to preview what lies ahead is OSCE Secretary General Lamberto Zanier, who just returned from the region and may be going back next week. Uh, a career diplomat in the Italian Foreign Service for over 30 years, he served as coordinator for EU foreign policy and permanent for, the, for EU foreign policy and perm rep, permanent representative of Italy to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. That's not to mention his work as U.S. Special Representative for Kosovo. As a personal aside, since we've met, I've had a pretty good three months here, uh, as I mentioned, because of our designation as the number one think tank. But he has had a much better three months. Uh, he will first deliver his remarks. We'll then have a brief conversation and turn over for your questions. And I don't see the clock here, but I'm sure it will appear uh, because we have an hour for this event and want to make sure that you can participate. So please welcome the Secretary General of the OSCE, uh, Lamberto Zanier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen, for your uh, nice introductory words. And then I'm, I'm here today to uh, uh, discuss with you uh, and to present to you a little bit the way we see things from the perspective of the OSC and the evolution of, uh, uh, of its agenda. Uh, uh, last year, interestingly, under uh, Ukrainian chairmanship, uh, Ukrainian had uh, uh, last year the rotating chairmanship of, uh, of the OSC, uh, we started a debate on the future uh, uh, design, if you want, of the uh, European security architecture, uh, working on the notion of uh, 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 the creation of a single security space stretching from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok, uh, 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 where uh, uh, various integration processes should, uh, uh, should somehow uh, um, uh, come together in a, in a cooperative, uh, uh, cooperative manner. And as we were working on this concept, uh, went under the, the, the heading of uh, Helsinki plus 40, next year being the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Helsinki Final Act, uh, what we saw on the ground was, in fact, uh, events uh, uh, moving in different directions. Uh, we saw integration spaces, uh, the, the, the European Union and its own neighborhood, uh, neighborhood policies entering somehow in collision uh, with other integration processes centered around, around Russia uh, uh, through a number of tools, the CIS, uh, the, the, uh, uh, a military arm, uh, which is the, the uh, Comprehensive Security Treaty Organization, the CSTO, uh, uh, the Eurasian uh, Union Project, uh, the Customs Union. Uh, and uh, Ukraine was right uh, at the center of this process. And uh, as I say, I saw it very closely because I was working uh, with Ukrainians on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on uh, chairing the organization and on driving this agenda of the organization. Ukraine has been very present, I would say, on the agenda of the organization throughout the last 25 years. And I would like to make a few quickly, a few, a few points there because they, quite a few things seem to come together uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this current crisis that we, uh, we, we are dealing with. Um, I, I still remember the beginning of the 90s. I was at the time serving in NATO, and, uh, and we had the discussions uh, both on, uh, uh, on the succession uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the various successor countries of the Soviet Union uh, 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 to the Soviet Union itself in terms of division uh, of, the, uh, of the Red Army, in a way, so the redistribution of, uh, 
uh, of the military equipment. Ukraine took the lead uh, at that time in, in uh, uh, pushing for a, a broad consultative process that should include uh, uh, all key stakeholders. We had uh, in NATO, we had a process of uh, discussion with Russia and others. And, and Ukraine was at the forefront of wanting uh, that uh, open process, open debate uh, in, a, in a transparent manner. The next step was the, was the discussion about the nuclear weapons and the denuclearization of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, where also NATO had to play a role uh, mediating in a way between Russia and Ukraine to uh, unblock uh, a process and the discussion that was uh, bilaterally very, very complicated. Uh, and that led, in fact, to uh, the famous Budapest Memorandum, uh, so where Russia provided security guarantees to Ukraine, including on territorial integrity of, uh, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, in that period, during the Italian uh, chairmanship of the OSC, uh, the OSC started looking also at some of the internal issues in Ukraine. Uh, missions were sent to Ukraine, and an office was opened in Crimea. Crimea having been identified as a particularly uh, sensitive area because of uh, 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 of the presence of, uh, of national minorities, the Tatars, uh, but also because of some of the uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, political relationships between uh, uh, local leadership and, uh, and Kiev and the status of, of Crimea itself. Um, that presence, uh, the, the conditions that the Ukrainians uh, at, the, at that point uh, uh, put on the SE was to open an office in Kiev to avoid that Crimea would be singled out. Uh, uh, through an OSCE mission there. And after a few years, in, I think around 2000, uh, then Ukraine insisted that the office in Crimea should be closed. And so we remained only as the OSCE with, uh, with only an office in, uh, in Kiev. Missed opportunity in a way, uh, yeah. seen now mm -hmm. uh, from, from, from today's perspective. Um, in, in another step uh, in my professional life uh, as director of the Conflict Prevention Center of the OSC, I found myself in Kiev in 2004 during the Orange Revolution, and I was observing. I had, uh, I think, I was in the delegation. Uh, del we had the last international meeting with uh, President Kuchma before uh, a, a beginning of a series of roundtables, so parallels uh, with processes that we start uh, uh, seeing developing today. Uh, that led uh, at that time to a decision to repeat the elections. Have those elections been uh, uh, um, uh, widely uh, um, uh, contested and, and, uh, uh, and therefore uh, object of a, of a um, uh, you know, lively public debate, let's call it that way. And I remember at the time as I was walking down Maidan and, uh, and the orange people uh, celebrating, etc., in the background, they were the marches of the blue people uh, coming from Donetsk, coming from the other regions, uh, with Yanukovych leading them, mm. and Ukrainian flags. They, they were turning up with Ukrainian, not Russian flags at the time. So that's another interesting, uh, interesting difference. Uh, so we had the elections, and then, and then the new pro-Western government, Yushchenko and, and Timoshenko. Um, then there were elections again in 2008. At that point, I was in Kosovo. Uh, but but uh, Lenarchic, the director of ODIR, our Office for Human Rights and uh, Democratic Institutions, uh, 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 which organizes these election monitoring operations also, um, was telling me that having observed elections throughout the years in Ukraine, ODIR found those elections in 2008 to be among the best ever elections held in the former Soviet space. So the, the, the pro-Western government did a very good job in organizing those elections. The only surprise was that the person who won those elections was Yanukovych, which shows, in a way, also the divisions that exist uh, in, the, in the Ukrainian society. Of course, then Yanukovych held elections again, and, but the elections he organized were not at all up to the same standards of the previous ones. That certainly he managed to... Uh, uh, to sail through those elections uh, uh, among uh, uh, very open criticism from, uh, from the OSC. Um, eve of the Ukrainian uh, chairmanship last year, there was a reshuffle in the government. I had prepared the chairmanship uh, with the minister whom I knew well from the early 90s because he was involved in the nuclear issues, uh, Grishenko, who was promoted in the new government as a deputy prime minister with a mandate to uh, work uh, towards the success of the Vilnius summit. So his job was to really to push uh, towards uh, stronger ties uh, uh, between Ukraine and the European Union. 
And I, uh, I got a phone call just after Christmas from the view uh, for a minister, Kojara, whom I also knew because he was the foreign, advice, foreign policy advisor of Kuchma in 2004. Uh, so a man, uh, a man of the parties uh, of the party of the regions, and uh, uh, who told me that a strategic decision had been made in Ukraine, uh, that Ukraine was moving westwards, wanted stronger relations with the EU, and he was going to work on that, and he was wanting also to use the chairmanship of the organization to profile in a positive way the country, and so uh, we had a very good cooperation in uh, uh, addressing the whole set of issues on the agenda of the OSCE. But I also got this push from them uh, in all my contacts with Fule, for instance, in sort of uh, uh, to lobby a little bit, to spend a good word for the efforts that Ukraine was making to, uh, 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 to run this, this European agenda. Uh, interestingly, as we went through the year, and I was uh, listening carefully to the way uh, Yanukovych and, and, uh, and Kozara were presenting their, their European project, this was always presented in a very balanced way. Uh, what I always said, uh, or what I always heard from their side was that uh, we'll move ahead, we want closer ties, uh, we want to modernize Ukraine, reform, that will be a good opportunity for us, and, uh, and the competition uh, uh, with the European market will prod us also to, to move on the, on the road of reform, but this will be fully compatible with a strong relationship with Russia, with the customs union, uh, so they were uh, still seeing uh, Ukraine is in a, in a, in a, as a bridge, in a way, between uh, you, these two broader integration processes. Um, what happened towards the end of the year is that uh, uh, they obviously, on the uh, point of relations with Russia, there had been miscalculations. Uh, uh, we saw a, 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 a more intense diplomatic offensive at the highest level from, from Russia and Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukraine, uh, and there myself, I was surprised to see how uh, much the, the economic issues had been underestimated uh, and the impact of those had been, had been uh, 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 underestimated. Uh, uh, other considerations may also have been at this point uh, made, and of course I, I, I don't know the details of the discussions between, uh, between the Ukrainians and the Russians at that point. But certainly there was a dramatic turnaround, and that's where the current chapter uh, uh, starts. Uh, the political process goes out in the streets. Uh, we see dramatic developments. The international community intervenes. Uh, uh, the president leaves the country. Uh, part of the country uh, doesn't recognize itself uh, in the new political processes in Kiev. Uh, the government, even the president, who is uh, an institutional figure, is the former, uh, or is the current, actually, uh, speaker of, uh, of the Rada, who is serving as an acting president, but because of his political uh, uh, affiliation is, uh, uh, is considered to be, or is, is not considered to be legitimate, because it's also the result of a process that is considered <coughs> to be widely considered to be illegitimate in the East, and of course the East uh, 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 profoundly influenced also by Russia, by the, the also the, the role of the Russia media play there, and uh, and we see a country increasingly uh, increasingly split. So there is a need uh, at this point uh, to uh, um, uh, intervene uh, with processes that bring the uh, the political discourse back to where it belongs, back to the parliament first of all. Uh, we need a political process that is inclusive. Uh, and and uh, the more uh, we see violence in the streets and we see difficult uh, 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 events uh, uh, which we have to face and which we have to deal with, uh, the more we feel that this engagement is, uh, this political engagement is, is urgent. So challenges that we, that, that we have now. Uh, I think yesterday we, we, had, uh, we saw a very positive development, uh, launching of a process of dialogue. We've been encouraging the Ukrainians to do that. We had a project uh, uh, running already for a couple of months on, uh, on uh, uh, promoting dialogue in Ukraine. It was really difficult to convince and to align everybody on this, uh, on this notion, uh, but, uh, but better late than never. Right. Even though the situation has deteriorated now, the conditions for this dialogue are much more difficult than they would have been a month and a half ago. Um, it's good that we have uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, independent and authoritative personalities uh, uh, that can uh, be recognized in all uh, parts of the countries. 
uh, for their role in the past, very institutional, um, also potentially very independent from, uh, from the government and from the other institutions. So uh, uh, they can, uh, at this point, uh, take on their shoulders uh, this responsibility of leading uh, a, a process, a positive process that will have to include at this point also an element of reconciliation beyond the, beyond the political dialogue because of the damage that the events are created in terms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, fractures within, uh, within the, the population. Uh, this is the challenges today. The OSC, uh, the OSC has found itself in, in the middle of, this, of all this because uh, as, as you heard, we, all the actors are there and, uh, and uh, uh, we found in the OSC the space to do a number of things, in, in, in fact, multiple things. What, what we have on the ground is a, a, a civilian monitoring operation, important for a number of reasons. It, it inserts uh, internationals on the ground in a balanced way. We have uh, 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 Western Europeans, Americans, but we have Russians, Armenians, Kazakhs, and Belarusians. So it's really a, 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 an operation that represents uh, the, the large uh, community in the, in the OSC, requested by the Ukrainians, so with, uh, with, the, with Ukrainian ownership. And this is uh, there and, and growing. And it's important also because, it, because of the monitoring. In a very polarized situation where you hear, you, you hear completely different narratives on what's happening, it's important to have an impartial presence there and an impartial reporting. Uh, we have the election, uh, um, uh, the, we have the long-term uh, monitoring mission now, and we're preparing for a massive uh, election, probably the biggest in the history of the OSC, uh, um, uh, observation of the elections. Elections will be important, will be an important occasion uh, to, to really uh, uh, move towards, uh, uh, towards a, a, a process, a, a national uh, uh, process, and, and giving more legitimacy to uh, a key institution in the country. Uh, but we also have the High Commission National Minorities, the Representative of Freedom of the Media, ODIR with the Human Rights Assessment Mission, our own Parliamentary Assembly, all in different uh, areas and from different angles engaging to address uh, uh, parts of, uh, uh, of the problem, and we find problems in all, in all these areas. So the whole toolbox of the OSC has been mobilized uh, to address uh, the various, uh, the various uh, sides of this, and we have this office in Kiev also that is very much at the center of this, and we're looking at how to upgrade it uh, and, and to, ad to adjust also what we do uh, in, uh, to respond to some of the challenges. We're now assisting the preparation of the elections, we're looking at police reform, etc. So it is, uh, it is a very dynamic phase, and we feel very much at the center of events, but of course it is a challenging phase for us and for the international community and for Ukraine, first of all. Well, thank you for those opening comments. Uh, we will get to your questions. We have uh, uh, quite a bit of time left. I do want to recognize the presence of at least two U.S. ambassadors to Ukraine. One is Bill Miller, our own Bill Miller, uh, who is a, a <coughs> distinguished scholar here, and the other is Jim Collins. Uh, and it, it is, he's, who's not here. Yes, he is, he's, he's right here, there. Yeah. I thought I saw him, but he was kind of like that, but so I. Ukraine, here, he oh, Russia. in Russia, excuse me. Um, but are there any other U.S. ambassadors who have been to the region who are here? No, well, some more are joining us a, a bit later. But at any rate, I appreciate those remarks, and let me um, ask you some questions about some items I, I didn't hear in your opening remarks. First mm -hmm. of all, how does the OSCE view last Sunday's referendums in Donetsk and Lugansk? Is that making your task harder, or, or is it, now that some time has passed, not, not very important? Well, those are, of course, we didn't recognize them. We didn't observe them. Uh, they, they, they were totally illegal from our, uh, from our perspective. The way they were conducting what we, what we saw also uh, on, on television, we, we even saw armed people in, in polling stations. Uh, so, uh, a, a, a political consultation taken in those circumstances is obviously of uh, extremely limited value. It's more, more than a, a, a perhaps a survey, and we're not, we're not sure. Um, uh, we, we know for sure that uh, uh, most of the organizers of, the, of this referendum didn't, uh, didn't even have access to uh, voters' lists uh, because the system had been uh, shut down by, uh, by the Central Electoral Commission in Kiev. Um, uh, but, but of course it establishes uh, uh, facts on the ground and a narrative that we'll have to deal with. Uh, so we are hearing statements and, uh, and, and the Ukrainians will have to react. 
Now, this is one of, the, one of those uh, instances where uh, this dialogue can, can play a role. Uh, I think it is important to reach out uh, for the Ukrainian through this process, to reach out to all stakeholders, including the difficult ones that were behind uh, these processes, and, uh, and to um, uh, see what ground can be found in discussing the, the way forward. While we say that uh, uh, the agenda of the dialogue is entirely in the hands of the Ukrainians, it's really up to them to, to decide what they want to discuss. But we know that some of these issues are, uh, are complicated. Uh, uh, what is key at this point is to have a process going, a process starting. Um, the, the issue of uh, decentralization, and some in the East want to talk about federalism, and ob even also federalism is... Uh, is a very vague word. Uh, word, you know. I'm, I'm coming from Austria, which is a federal country. The US are a federal country. Uh, Germany and, and Russia, uh, uh, but also Bosnia Herzegovina is a federal country. And there's Republika Srpska there, and uh, and we see some of the complicated dynamics in so in, in some of the models. Uh, so those who are uh, proposing federalism, w what are they proposing exactly? So this is something that that will have to be clarified in this in this debate. And when. Uh, people uh, come to participate in these roundtables, which I know you said could be held in, in a number of locations around the country. They're not going to be able to come with their black masks and their weapons. Is that correct? They'll have to identify themselves and sit at the table and... Well, it, it seems to me that those who have uh, uh, chosen the way of violence and the use of weapons have uh, automatically disqualified themselves from, uh, from sitting at, at, at the table. Uh, th I think there are, we, we are seeing, you know, different levels of players at this point. Uh, by the way, some of these masked men, we are not even sure they, who they are and where they are coming from. Uh, but but uh, uh, there are all, all sorts of uh, legal or self-proclaimed authorities, and there are people that have influence over these um, groups or might have some influence, uh, people might, who might be totally disconnected from them. So uh, at this point, it's also a matter of... Uh, 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 identifying who are the significant interlocutors, those who can, uh, can assist. Uh, I would be very pragmatic in, in moving forward. One, one of the good things about the process that is starting is that um, uh, we have an, a, a, a couple of uh, uh, capable uh, and, and very well-respected high-level uh, facilitators of the process, Ukrainian, they can take on their shoulders uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, choosing, selecting their own interlocutors. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a, a healthy uh, uh, setup in itself, uh, because the government can take a bit of a distance and can watch uh, uh, things as, uh, as uh, uh, these facilitators drive the process forward and, uh, and hopefully manage uh, to, uh, to create a, a positive political dynamic within which then the elections would become a success and then, and then you start a positive spiral. That's a very significant point because not only does it give the government distance but it also gives some of the participants permission because then they're not negotiating with a government that they may perceive, per perceive as illegitimate. They're negotiating with a, in a process exactly. that exactly. is a Ukrainian run process for all Ukraine sponsored exactly. by an organization which they belong to. Um, speaking of that, you mentioned Yanukovych and the role he has played in the past. Uh, is there any role for him now? Does he choose to play a role now in these roundtables, personally? I think this would be very extremely difficult, given everything, everything that has happened there. Uh, uh, plus, it's not very clear what role Yanukovych is playing now from where he is. Uh, so I, I really don't think uh, that there is, uh, there is room for him personally to, uh, to play a role, uh, given, uh, given what we've seen in the past. Um, but I wouldn't even personalize this too much. One, one of the issues is the political forces and, and the party of the regions. Uh, the party of the regions is in shutters, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some of the uh, parliamentarians that are expression of these uh, uh, regions in the East uh, uh, are running the risk of losing uh, the contact with their own constituencies. So part of this, the dialogue should be very close uh, to the RADA, to the parliament, and should help also the parliament to regain authority, uh, become again the central institution of the country, recognized by everybody, and making sure also that, the, uh, that there is uh, this re reconnection, if you want, of, uh, 
of the uh, representatives of the members of the parliament with their own constituencies, I think is important. My, my personal view is, is that there would be also a need for parliamentary elections pretty soon, uh, pretty soon mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Also, to, uh, to, uh, as soon as the dialogue takes, uh, 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 takes a positive uh, uh, spin and starts giving results, I think uh, that, that, that would be the next, uh, the next necessary step in my view. And speaking of elections, just a final question on this piece, and then I have one other question. Um, the, a reporter asked me this yesterday, uh, and my response was the May 25th elections are, are seen, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, they're seen by, uh, my view is, they should be the forcing mechanism to get a lot of this work done before the election, uh, which would set up a better chance for the election to be to have national participation and be perceived as successful. Uh, do you see it that way? To a point. Uh, I don't think we should force this process. The other, I, I think it's important that it starts and it, you know, it progresses as much as possible before the elections because it will create a positive dynamic for the elections themselves. But it should remain an open-ended process. There shouldn't be deadlines there. But I think this dialogue should, should also continue. It should be an element of reassurance also to, uh, to the people. And it, it will be for the facilitators themselves to determine at some point uh, uh, the, the, the pace and, uh, and, uh, and also the, the duration. Obviously, when I say open-ended, I'm not saying that this should go on for years. Right. But, uh, but certainly, uh, uh, the time that is required uh, uh, for uh, uh, this process of, of reconnection and, and, and clarification of some of the fundamentals to take place. But it, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It also matters what other actions Russia is threatening to take or might, may take. And then there's this issue about what sanctions uh, the West is prepared to impose if the election doesn't go well and there doesn't seem to be a resolution of, of the problem, especially a cessation of violence. And both uh, Chancellor uh, Merkel and President Obama have talked about uh, the fact that, that having a, an open and fair election is critical in the decision about whether to ratchet up the sanctions to, to uh, uh, very hard-hitting sectoral sanctions. So how do you see that process intersecting the work that you're doing? Um, I, I think because of what we said at the beginning, because this process also goes back to this uh, clash, if you want, uh, uh, between spaces that are, that are developing. There is also a strong responsibility of the countries uh, around. I'm looking at the, the OSCE family in a way, and the key players within the OSCE family to play a positive role in this. Uh, uh, so the chairman of the OSC was recently in, in Moscow. He had a meeting with President Putin. Uh, after that meeting, we heard a number of statements, including a positive statement vis-a-vis -vis the elections, which was uh, a, a change uh, compared to what we'd heard before. And, and that, that was a positive change. We want to see more. And uh, I, I recently, in Vienna, a meeting with the Russian ambassador, I made very clear the point that uh, 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 we see in a situation that is very polarized on the ground, where we see also the media, and we hear the narratives we hear uh, uh, on the media are, are very different uh, if you compare Russian and, and Western media. And this is dividing uh, uh, people on the ground, and uh, is creating uh, perceptions that are so different that then this, this uh, is, is uh, 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 how to say, gasoline on the fire. Uh, so we need everybody to contribute to this de-escalation, also from a political process and with the right messaging, before we reach a stage where everybody loses control and then, and then we face a process where, uh, uh, where it is very difficult for the international community well, to play a role. there are obviously a lot of moving parts, and this is my, my final question, so please get ready to ask your questions. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns, who sadly is resigning later this year, uh, many of us think it's a catastrophic loss in terms of talents and wisdom in our government. Uh, and he is also uh, a former ambassador to Russia, has observed that there are four parts to our strategy with Ukraine. And I want to end on the part I want to ask the question about. One part is the need to support NATO. A second part is the need to put pressure on Russia through sanctions. A third part is the need to uh, hopefully um, finish negotiations and ratify a big trading regime, TTIP, with, between Europe and uh, the U.S. But the fourth part uh, is what he calls empowering Ukraine. And empowering Ukraine has two parts. One part is the provision of aid from the West, and surely uh, 
among others, uh, the IMF is ready to provide, I think it is $17 billion in aid to Ukraine uh, uh, in, in loans and conditions have to be met. But the other part, and this is what I want to ask you about, is the, the hope that the, the collective pressure and the involvement of Ukrainians will end up with a government in Ukraine, for Ukraine, that is uh, competent, transparent, and responsible, which is not the description of prior governments in Ukraine. And so my final question to you is, what role can the OSCE play in assuring or helping to assure that that peace happens, that, that Ukraine's, the Ukrainians elect uh, a government, and I assume a parliament to follow, that is responsible, capable, and transparent, uh, unlike governments it's had before? Um, I, I would say that this is a, a, a collective responsibility uh, from uh, countries in the OSCE to assist. But first of all, it's a responsibility of the Ukrainians. And, and on, on some of these issues, uh, for instance, the dialogue we're talking about, we've been pushing for quite some time to see uh, uh, initiatives, to see movement. So we need to make sure that there is, uh, uh, and, and that's what we're working on the, in the OSC, a shared strategy in the international community uh, around some key, uh, uh, key uh, uh, principles. Geneva was also about that. It was, was building a, a strategy. We want to see also engagement from everybody in supporting the implementation of the strategy. These are not simply declaratory principles, but they are guidelines right. for action. Right. Uh, so that's where now we are engaging uh, with the key uh, partners in the OSC to see that action, because this is, this is the time for this. Uh, if we miss the opportunity now, uh, if uh, we want to make the elections a success, it, I think it's a, it's a key uh, point in this uh, uh, to, to turn around a, a process that is uh, problematic in many aspects. We see the engagement of the ground and we, we are worried at some of the potential scenarios. Uh, so we want to see uh, an engagement and we, we want to see this uh, uh, translated in, uh, uh, in initiatives, uh, political initiatives and concrete initiatives on the ground that will help uh, with the concrete de-escalation. We are ready, we are setting up uh, uh, projects to uh, collect the weapons. Uh, um, uh, we are discussing how to you know, free up buildings, etc. But we need to get the political process going. And, and uh, we can only do it with the support of everybody. Well, sadly, we've seen a lot of elections around the world recently mm. that have ended up ratifying bad leaders and not generating responsible new or, or uh, uh, reinvented leaders who would bring less corrupt and more, capa uh, and more capable government to the people, which is, after all, what they want. Um, so I hope you're right. All right, we have 19 minutes for questions. And um, please identify yourself and ask a brief question. We have microphones there, uh, both sides. So we'll try to be efficient. Let's start with the woman over there. Thank you. Uh, Natasha Mosgova with the Voice of America. Um, I was wondering how uh, cooperative uh, Russians uh, really are, because it seems, at least today, um, the, well, we've heard uh, remarks um, undermining uh, on credibility of uh, OSC reports, saying that it was purged uh, uh, for following this, uh, the pressure of uh, Kiev. It didn't include referenda, for example. It didn't include um, attacks against civilians, etc. I was wondering what do you think about it. Thank you. To reply me. Um, uh, with the Russians, I, I had consultations recently uh, with the delegation, high level delegation coming to Vienna from Moscow, and we discussed also issues related to the operation on the, gro on the ground. F first of all, that's an operation uh, of which Russia is, is fully part. Uh, so the reporting reflects also the work of the Russians uh, that are part of that, uh, of that operation. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we are reporting about the things we observe. One of the points I'm making is that I'm trying, and um, if I make maybe make, make a comment on the, in the margins of this, uh, we are in a phase where we found in the OSC a tool that is useful for the international community uh, to intervene and to help de-escalate the conflict. Uh, we uh, aligned everybody around the notion of, uh, of, of a mandate for this operation. Uh, we circulated the concept. Uh, we. Uh, uh, specified also the uh, resources that we are need that are needed uh, for this operation. When it comes then to 
getting those resources from, from our own participating states, financial, human, etc., then things change and things go move very slowly. Uh, so I think there is also uh, uh, a need for a good understanding on the side of the international community as such uh, that uh, if uh, 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 we want a, 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 a result that is at the level of the expectation, including uh, the ability for us to report on every single thing uh, that is going on in the very, uh, then the mission is, uh, is covering the whole of, uh, of Ukraine. So it's, it's a huge territory and we have 200 now, 200 people. And, uh, we, we, are half, we have half of the people we would need, or at least we're authorized to, uh, to deploy at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised to see that we didn't get more uh, support financial, in financial and human terms. Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, it is a key moment, it's a key phase in this crisis. I would have expected a stronger, uh, a stronger support from the international community. The Russians, uh, I have to say, they, they told me that they are going to give us more people and they give us more money. I'm still, I'm still waiting for that uh, from them too, as from many others. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the back. Uh, gentlemen, right there with your hand in the middle, that, right there. Hi, Mr. Secretary General, John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the criticisms that the uh, OSC brokered talks and dialogue that launched yesterday uh, don't include uh, pro-Russian uh, uh, rebels uh, and, and whether or not you, you talked briefly about how they uh, some have disqualified themselves by embracing violence. Uh, but what about other uh, pro-Russian rebels? You see, our role is to support this process. Uh, we, we don't want to organize things. It's really the Ukrainians themselves have to organize them. Now, they have appointed uh, these two co-facilitators. The OSC has appointed a high-level uh, personality, Ambassador Ischinger, to support this, this process. Uh, but it's really, and, and we want to give a strong ownership, a strong Ukrainian ownership uh, uh, to this. It is really for them uh, uh, to draw the line, also to take the responsibility on themselves of deciding uh, how far they want to go in terms of engaging. Uh, but, you know, playing it very safe uh, may become not very significant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's important to marginalize those that have embraced, as you say, as you put it, have embraced violence. Uh, so between those two, there is, there is some space and some uh, room for maneuver. And, and that's where I think uh, uh, that it would be important for the facilitators uh, to also uh, to show uh, a proactive approach in engaging with as many significant actors uh, is, is needed for them to bring home a, a, a positive result. Thank you. We'll go over to this side. Um, right there. Big hand waving. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Scott Carlson. I'm with New Rule and Democracy Council. I thank you for hosting this event today and Mr. Secretary General for your time. Once upon a time, 15 years ago, I had the pleasure of working for the OSCE and another sector of the world on a consultative constitutional process. Currently, we understand that the interim government is going to push for what I would say is somewhat of a top-down uh, constitutional process culminating in September. I'm wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on that first and what are the possibilities for elongating that and sort of reaching out to the grassroots level for consultations. Thank you. So I think, uh, first of all, that there are two sides to this. One is the role that the international community can play in uh, advising the, uh, the RADA uh, in uh, their uh, work on this. And uh, this is where uh, we have uh, tools uh, for that. The best we have in Europe is the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe. Uh, which is already engaging uh, uh, with the Parliament, uh, with the Rada, and I think that element of support uh, should continue. It's a, it's more technical in a way, but it's some of the best expertise we have uh, we have in Europe. Uh, the second aspect is to make sure that this process is seen uh, as uh, uh, not too much top down, uh, but it's it's taking place in an environment where people feel they've been consulted and, uh, and opinions are you know taken on board. Uh, this is why uh, this element uh, uh, should ideally be part of the process of consultation and the dialogue uh, uh, led by the co-facilitators. As I say, it's, it's up to them to decide what to put in the agenda, 
but certainly uh, in a phase when there is a high expectation that key issues uh, that will be covered by the Constitution uh, uh, should be discussed, uh, uh, at least an element of consultation on, uh, on, on, on these. The fact that the debate takes place in the Rada is, is good enough, but as I, as I said earlier, the Rada is seen in the East as not necessarily representing uh, some of the views of, uh, uh, of the local leaders. So that's where there is a need for an outreach through a political process. Okay, in the front row. Thank you, Jane. My name is Edward Joseph with the Johns Hopkins Science Lumberto. Great to see you. As Jane mentioned, not only are we fortunate to have an organization where both Ukraine and Russia and the United States are all members, but I think we're fortunate to have a Secretary General like you with your experience and determination in this uh, crisis. Really I quite planted fortunate. this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Secretary General, you mentioned the many tools that OSC has and that is currently deploying High Commissioner for National Minorities, this human rights assessment, your election monitors. Is there something perhaps that you could share here with us in Washington about the conclusions and, and the observations of all of these uh, tools, perhaps things that, that are not so evident from the media with respect in particular to the Russian, many Russian claims of allegations of the endangered minorities, the language rights, even these questions about neo-fascists. So something perhaps you could share with us from all those tools. Thank you very much, sir. There is a, a large variety of reports. Uh, uh, of course, these are reports at different levels. Some, for instance, the reports of the High Commission of National Minorities are by uh, their nature confidential, so they are kept very, uh, very internal. Others are very public. The interventions of the representative of freedom of the media are, are very public. There are press statements uh, uh, about, for instance, uh, the access of people to uh, uh, public information. We, we have seen now uh, obstructions. We've seen occupation of, uh, of uh, transmission centers for, uh, for uh, television networks. Uh, we've seen some uh, networks being obscured. Uh, uh, so there have been problems in, in different directions. Uh, 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 at some point, also Russian minorities have been negatively uh, affected uh, by, by some of these uh, of the measures that have been taken. Uh, the Russian-speaking minorities, I mean, and uh, uh, and therefore I think that there is there have been a number of balanced interventions in this. But the most important uh, um, uh, issue is that of the reports of the monitoring mission. Those are daily reports. Uh, they are public. We put them on our website. We uh, uh, put them in press statements. There's a lot of attention. As you heard earlier, there are also demarches from those who believe that we don't fully uh, 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 portray uh, uh, the picture as, as it is perceived by one or another. I think the added value of what we do is exactly the fact that uh, we are walking a line that is probably halfway between uh, the narratives on one or the other side, or maybe not halfway, but somewhere between. Uh, the two, so, so uh, those who have a perception, a different perception, may not uh, find our reports in line with their perceptions. Uh, that's not uh, uh, that's not a bad thing, in fact. And the fact that we have this uh, multinational setup uh, also protects us from accusation of running a political agenda of uh, of somebody. Uh, so, so I think that that's really what we uh, uh, what we find. It's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing process, and of course we do see the problems at uh, both ends of the spectrum. And certainly, uh, you refer to some of the far right, uh, the activities of the far right movements, and we observe some of those as well. I uh, look at all these questions, but just to piggyback on that, I mentioned that you operate by consensus. As you do these things uh, on behalf of 57 member states, is it possible for one of those states just uh, arbitrarily, uh, maybe not arbitrarily, for a cause as they perceive it, to block you from continuing? Could that happen? We have a mandate for that. It's a six-month six uh, mandate uh, initially. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when it comes to the renewal of the mandate, if there is a major okay. problem, we might have a discussion about this. Uh, but it seems to me, having uh, engaged with a number of actors, obviously nobody knows what the situation will be in September and whether we need to continue 
uh, at this point, uh, whether we'll need to continue the operation, but nobody seems to have problems in principle. Nobody's screaming, saying, we'll close it down as soon as we can. So for the moment, so they don't the have moment, the, a procedural they, mechanism they, 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 to no, do that. No, no, no. And, there are, and, uh, and we, we are not picking, while there are complaints here and there, we, don't, we, we are not sensing that there is a, 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 a basic problem with what we're doing. There was a woman in red right here. I don't see your hand anymore. Uh, maybe it's, I, all right, further back on, on the aisle, right there. Winsome Packer, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Can you speak into your mic? Winsome Packer, and my question is my own. Um, the OECE has talked and worked for the last few years on early warning and conflict um, management efforts to enhance its capacity in these areas. No one seemed to um, uh, recognize the symptom or the, the warnings or the, 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 um, the possibility that Georgia, that Georgia could have happened in 2008 at the OECE, even though there were overflights and there were um, incursions into um, South Ossetia and you know the rail, the Russian repair of the railroad tracks in order to move its troops in later, um, and no one seemed to to um, recognize Ukra the events in Crimea. And I'm wondering if the OECE missed um, these elements and what you might be d be done in the future to enhance these capacities. Well, as I, as I mentioned, we had an office in Crimea, and we had an office in Crimea uh, a few months ago. We might have uh, uh, picked some signals, but being, being in Kiev, this was, uh, you know, uh, the Ukrainians themselves were taken by surprise, and, uh, and the international community was taken by surprise by, by uh, uh, developments there. So without having a presence in the region, I, I was myself twice in Crimea last year, once for the Yalta Security Conference. And, uh, um, and we discussed about everything, certainly not about Crimea. Uh, it was not, not an issue in terms of uh, you know, upcoming uh, foreseeable security challenges. And, and as I say, not, uh, not being based there, I didn't have a good reading of, uh, of the local political processes that might perhaps have given some indications of what might have, uh, might have come. So for, uh, uh, to have an effective uh, early warning tool, you need also to have the presence of the ground. That's, that's an, essential, uh, an essential element. Uh, there's a woman with glasses in the fourth row. Just waved her hand. Thank you. I'm Lara Jakes with Associated Press. Um, Mr. Secretary General, you spoke a few minutes, minutes ago about needing to walk this fine line as um, the OSCE with all of these member states. Jane, a few minutes ago, mentioned what the State Department four-prong strategy is, referring to NATO, referring to the sanctions, referring to the TTIP agreement. Um, it, there's a perception in the West that these are all issues on which Russia is trying to draw drive a wedge between the U.S. and the E.U. And in your role as this kind of arbiter um, on all sides, do you agree with that perception? And if so, why do you think Russia is doing this? Well, you should ask the Russians, not me. But, uh, uh, well, we see it's, it's not only a, a, an issue of different perceptions in different, uh, in different quarters in the West. Uh, if, if you look uh, uh, more closely, as I, as I do from Vienna into the European Union. I was in Brussels recently at discussions uh, 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 with the, 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 the member states in the, in the EU in one of their uh, political consultation fora. Uh, I, I sensed uh, that there, are, there, there is a different positioning, also in terms of the role of, its, of the EU itself, uh, whether the EU should be more active on the ground, whether the EU should use more the OSCE, uh, as uh, as a tool for its own uh, for its own policies, uh, and uh, um, so the, you know whether Russia is deliberately uh, uh, playing playing this card. It's uh, it's at this point uh, speculation, difficult also for me to comment from my uh, from my position. But certainly there is uh, 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 in real terms uh, uh, there are different perceptions and, and the Ukrainian policy. I would say also that uh, one of the things uh, we see, f and I see from my perspective, uh, the Ukrainian policy by some uh, European countries is driven mainly by Russia-related considerations. So the Russian policy is driving also their Ukrainian policy. And in my view, 
uh, there is a risk there of missing some important uh, uh, elements in terms of uh, strategy uh, uh, to address the Ukrainian issues. I think this is a time where uh, we need to focus primarily on Ukraine, on the internal Ukrainian problems. We need to address those. The Russian issue, of course, and Russia will remain the elephant in the room in this discussion in many ways, uh, but, but the primary focus now should be on Ukraine, what we need to, to do to, to get things right and to get a positive that is pro that is uh, the process that is positive and to avoid that the situation gets out of hand. Then, of course, the issue of relations with Russia will remain. That's a longer term uh, issue. And, you know, whether it's sanctions or, uh, or whether the, the EU and the Europeans themselves uh, uh, manage to find, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a more strategic approach vis-a-vis -vis Russia that could also include, from an OAC perspective, and what we were working on when this whole thing started was the idea of having uh, these groupings within the OSC find uh, uh, areas of cooperation, so develop, uh, uh, develop in a cooperative. Uh, it's never too late to go back uh, to a more cooperative. But certainly uh, uh, now Ukraine is turning things uh, in a completely different direction, and we need to deal with that. Final question. Sorry about this, folks. Is the man in the red tie right here? Uh, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Mr. Secretary General, I wish you would elaborate on something you mentioned about the, uh, the Ukrainian economy, that when there was a realization that uh, the uh, affiliation with the EU would have certain economic effects that were negative, the, the, or, the general narrative is that Yanukovych spoke with Putin, Putin put pressure on him and said we can't go into the EU. But there seems to have been also a process when he went to Vilnius that there was a sudden realization of what the economic preconditions would be for joining the EU. And we've seen in other cases what we used to call shock therapy, we now call reform, does have deleterious uh, effects on the economy, and especially the economy of the eastern Ukraine where most of the industry is located. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that because that issue is still going to be current. Whatever happens in this present crisis, those conditionalities are still going to be there, and they're going to have to face that. And I'd like to know if, what you could say Good about question. that. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a very important element, this, and of course I didn't elaborate on this. But uh, uh, beyond the issue of, uh, of good governance, which is an issue that you know, very, uh, problem is very pervasive every, everywhere, um, uh, the, the next problem is uh, the lack of, uh, of reform. Uh, uh, in the you know, key economic structures in Ukraine over the last 25 years. Uh, uh, too little has been, uh, has been done. Uh, the uh, heavy industry in Ukraine is very uh, closely linked with the Russian uh, industrial apparatus. Uh, uh, we still have significant elements of the former Soviet political, uh, the, sorry, uh, military uh, apparatus still based in Ukraine. So there are also there, very, very close uh, links uh, with, uh, with Russia. So there are very strong economic interests uh, uh, in terms of that, uh, that apparatus in, uh, in a European Union context would probably be uh, not very competitive. That would need major uh, restructuring and, and major reforms. Uh, so this is why I think also uh, uh, the, the previous leadership was looking at uh, deepening and developing its own relations with the European Union, but uh, uh, at, uh, you know, uh, at its own pace, uh, uh, because they felt uh, that the links and the, in the economic interests uh, uh, with Russia had uh, to be safeguarded. And, uh, and I think they were looking at a very long-term develop development of the relationship uh, uh, with the European Union. That was the perception I have, but now a, a, a quick push uh, uh, towards uh, the European Union may uh, uh, produce uh, repercussions also at the economic level internally that might add on to the political problems that we see. Well, none of these problems is easy, obviously, and thank you all for excellent questions, but a special thank you to uh, Secretary General Zamber Zamberto for being so candid with us and for shouldering an enormous responsibility with wisdom and commitment. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if Ukraine turns out right? And wouldn't it be wonderful if the OSCE, an organization created years ago with great promise, turns out to, to fulfill its mandate as the only regional organization with all the member states inside? And uh, the Wilson Center is delighted to host you today, and we 
uh, will be on the ground with you and watch with enormous interest uh, as events unfold. So thank you again for coming, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.